So, hello everybody, I'm Dimitri Stiliadis, I'm with Nuas Networks. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of uh, background and a little bit of our views of uh, uh, virtual networking here and I'm actually going to visit in a, maybe a little bit of a different perspective uh, than what Martin did earlier. So, nevertheless, he started with a, a very good introduction there on uh, and the very big confusion if you want, what is SDN, right? So I'm going to start with what's SDN, the acronym. You will see different standards organizations have different interpretations about even the acronym itself. And uh, there are some even better quotes about what SDN means. Uh, some uh, even better quotes saying still doing nothing. There is a... Uh, even better things still don't know. Well, I'm going to give you also my interpretation of what's this elephant in the room over here. Um, so when we, every time I try to give this talk, I, I often start with this, uh, what I call the, the seven or eight fallacies of distributed systems. Uh, this is actually a, a very old way of, uh, of understanding this, anytime an application developer sees the network, they see it pretty much as a black box, right? They want to see it as a black box. Packets go in, packets come out. They don't want to care about the network. They want to ignore it as much as they can. And uh, actually, this is a famous quote that was uh, several years old. It's from 94. Sometimes my wife tells me that I have this memory of the elephant over there. I like all these old quotes. And, uh, this, uh, this seven or eight fallacies, right, say that when you build a large distributed application, you cannot really ignore the network, right? The network has not zero latency. It's going to fail. The topology is not constant. Things are going to change. So you have to adapt the applications around that. So there is always this disconnect, right, between the applications and the network and what the applications want and what does the network want and all these kind of things. So to a very large extent now, Network virtualization and the whole story about network virtualization is coming to bridge this gap, right? It's coming to bridge the gap between the application developers and what they want and the network that is kind of still a black box uh, on the way people see it and they don't really know how to, how to program it or how to adapt to it. But when we are trying to solve this network virtualization problem, when we are trying to expose, if you want, this programmability, this abstraction of the network to the applications, there are also often two different schools of thought. And uh, there is one set of solutions that start from the application, and they think that I can manage everything I want into the network with APIs and, if you want, application-friendly mechanisms. And to a very large extent, when we started this thinking, this whole thinking about what we are doing over here, I was coming, if you want, from the screwdriver perspective. Everything was a screw. I had the screwdriver in my hand. I'm going to find the solution. Then there is the, the other, if you want, approach, the networking approach that always starts from the network protocol perspective. Everything is a network protocol. In order to address the next possible solution in the data center, the cloud, whatever, let's invent another protocol. Let's go to ITF. Let's standardize it. And we're going to solve our problem, right? That's the classic network approach. And again, there, everything is a nail. And I have a hammer. And I'm going to solve my problem with a nail and a hammer. The reality is, when you think about it, that the problem is different. It's not a nail, it's not a screw. And uh, we have to think about this problem in a different way and understand this problem in a different way in order to find the right solution. So I'm going to walk you through now how can we find the right tool for this problem as opposed to the hammer and the, and the screwdriver. So when cloud networking and data center networking started, right, the, the first idea of virtualization or abstraction was the VLAN. The idea is very simple. VLAN provides me some form of network virtualization. I'm going to place the, my different tenants on different VLANs. They can reuse the same IP addresses. They are very much isolated. It's very difficult to cross traffic between VLANs unless you introduce routers and all these kind of things. But they come with a whole set of problems, right? They don't really scale. My core network is an L2 network who is going to program VLAN ports there. We actually still have discussions. I heard some discussions in Quantum about programming VLAN ports on switches. It's still very complex. We have, you know, it's, it's not something that can be solved easily. We have broadcast traffic. We have multicast traffic, all kinds of stability issues. I think people have realized by now VLANs is not the right problem. We need some abstraction, some virtualization on top of VLANs. 
And if you think about it, again, going back to the memory thing, we had the same problem before. 10, 15 years ago, when the service providers started looking at managed VPN services, they started with VLANs again. And the first types of managed VPN services were VLANs. And then after a lot of effort and a lot of discussion, if you think about it, oh, sorry, going backwards here. We thought, hold on a minute, this, this problem of virtualization, right? We really have solved it before back in the, if you want in the Metro Ethernet days or whatever, and the answer back there was layer two and layer three VPNs, right? So I will, I will actually disagree with Martin that said earlier that we had no network virtualization before, that's wrong. We have network virtualization for the last 15 years. We had layer two, layer three networks, network virtualization for at least the last 12 years. They have been deployed at very large scale. I'm talking about thousands of customers with uh, thousands of endpoints, right? Very large networks. And pretty much actually, if you think about it, pretty much every enterprise right now is on top of some network virtualization on top of, of uh, an MPLS IP VPN or layer two VPN or layer two, three VPLS or whatever network, right? These are services that have been stable there for a while. But, right, they are there for a while. They have been operational for a while. They have issues though. They are not really made if you want for the data center and cloud environment because the time scales of changing the services are not really the time scales in the cloud environment. I cannot bring up an MPLS VPN in five minutes and then tear it down in another six and then bring up another one in another 10, right? They are not made for this rapid up and down of services. They are also not made for a very large number of endpoints. So yeah, they are there, they have scale. There is a lot to learn out of them. We cannot ignore the past. However, they need some adjustment in order to make them usable in the data center and cloud environment. So to a very large extent, I represent them with a hammer, right? Then network virtualization came along, right? And then network virtualization started talking, I'm gonna use IP in IP tunnels in the data center, fine, good, and everything is good. And uh, if I want some routing functions, potentially I'm gonna add a virtual machine, and the virtual machine is gonna be the router. They solved a little bit the problem, but within the confines, or if you want, within the borders of a data center. Most of the network virtualization solutions out there, or even if you want the, if you take an open vSuite plugin, for example, in Quantum or whatever, they're confined in a single data center. I have a single administrative domain, I manage every single resource there, and I try to solve the problem within, if you want, my arms. However, the problem is much more complex than that, and I will come to this. And to a certain extent, this is a screwdriver approach, right? We're gonna solve the problem by ma just making everything API calls and so on, right? It's again, this. It's, if you want, it's your own particular way of viewing the problem. Now, if we think a little bit about extending all these networks out of the individual premises of the cloud or the data center, right? And if we think of, okay, I have a data center provider that is gonna deploy my services, a bunch of VMs potentially in a VLAN and so on, and I'm I want to extend this now, right? I want to be able to access this network and the services from my enterprise sites. So if you want, I want to create this hybrid cloud approach. The status quo, the most popular solution out there right now, is I'm gonna use some form of IPsec VPNs in order to create an IPsec tunnel uh, from my gateway over there in the data center to my enterprise site. But then I really have to manage that. I have to manage certificates, I have to manage securities, I, and I'll show you some examples out of Amazon on what I have to do to deal with these problems. And I have to rely on the public internet, right? And the reality is that, yes, I can rely on the public internet for this type of services, but in a lot of enterprise cases, this is not good enough, right? In a, the, the majority of, if you want, the highest LA, uh, enterprise services are very often run over managed VPNs. So what the enterprises have is they will have a, a layer three VPN service or a layer two VPN service or a mixed mode service that they buy from some service provider in order to interconnect their different branches or their different sites. And now you add a data center in this picture and you give to the users the capability to go instantiate services in the cloud or in the data center. And what they want is they want a seamless expansion, if you want, of the enterprise services inside the data center. A seamless expansion of the, of the network of the enterprise to reach all the way inside the data center, right? 
So on the left, I show a case where I have a layer 3 VPN that I'm using in my main network to interconnect my branches, and I need to expand that. On the right side, I show a more convoluted, if you want, uh, uh, use case, where in this case, I can have an enterprise subnet in one of my locations. I want to extend the subnet for disaster recovery reasons inside the data center. I have another enterprise site in another location. I extend this subnet, again, to a cloud service provider data center or as a layer two subnet. And then I have, I need the ability to do both layer two, layer three switching and interconnect all the services together so that anybody can talk to anybody, right? So these are use cases that we see constantly brought up by enterprises, especially when they're looking about SLAs. They're looking about real workloads that they want to move to the cloud, not just the, if you want the web properties in the front that they access the public network. So let's take one of these use cases in detail, right? And what I want to show you is, let's think a little bit how the state of the art cloud has actually implemented these services, right? And I will go with the Amazon implementation of these advanced services to illustrate the amount of complexity and manual provisioning needed by the end users in order to make this a reality. So let's take first of all the, uh, the suggestion by Amazon in order to create two VPCs and interconnect them together, right? This is nothing more than that, right? So the, the recommendation by Amazon in order to do that is you create one VPC, you create a second VPC, that's fine, that's easy maybe so far. Then you have to go and instantiate gateways for each one of your VPCs. And because you cannot really uh, just put one gateway because you are looking for reliability, right? This is the left, the one VPC, this is the other VPC. You end up instantiating two gateways on each one of your VPCs. You end up doing IPsec tunnels. There is an IPsec tunnel here missing because in reality you need to cross-connect this as well but you need to do IPsec tunnels between the gateways. You need to instantiate your own VPN monitor. They don't give it for you. You have to go write your own monitor to figure out which gateway is up, which gateway is down, and so on. And you need to go populate all the routing tables in all the gateways. And after you do all these things, you will finally have a service where you have two VPCs in Amazon that are in two different data centers, let's say, one is Amazon East, one is Amazon West. And after you have finished all this, you will have the ability to make these two talk to each other. It's very complicated, right? There is a lot of manual provisioning. Even a small error in an IP address here is gonna make this, thing, this whole thing fall apart. It's completely manual, and this is the state of the art in a cloud environment today, right? Because by far, the AWS West case is the state of the art here. And it is, to a certain extent, a screwdriver approach. Now, let's, uh, let's go in another use case that says that I have my cloud environment, I'm using whatever I want to use, OpenStack or whatever I want to use to create services in my cloud environment, and I want the connectivity now to a managed VPN service, right? And uh, for this reason, assume that the service provider, whoever is the service provider of choice for the enterprise, they have given them a managed VPN service, they have interconnected all their sites now, and now the same enterprise goes to a cloud provider and activates a service. And they want now to interconnect this application that they instantiated in the service, in the cloud service provider environment with the rest of their services and the rest of their enterprise sites. Now, in order to do that, the most prominent, if you want, mechanism or the most likely mechanism is that from this router that you have in this service over there on the left, you're going to hand over a VLAN if you want to the provider or to the edge router of the provider in order to do this service teaching, right? And I was actually yesterday in the, the quantum talks and there was a lot of discussion about introducing VPN services in quantum and so on. And there is a good discussion there, right? That fine, I'm gonna create the API now to say that I want to connect my router to the VPN service of the service provider, right? But remember, the left side and the right side and the right side in most cases are different administrative domains. They are not the same domain, right? The left side can be an OpenStack cloud provider. The right side can be Verizon or AT&T or whoever else. So now you go and create the VPN service <coughs> in OpenStack in Quantum, for example, and you activate it all the way to the router that is sitting over there on the, on the cloud. But how do you talk now to the one network? 
How do you do this interface between these two different administrative domains? In other words, just exposing an API in quantum and implementing the VPN edge router, if you want, inside the data center doesn't mean you have bridged the two different administrative domains. So how do you do this interface? The answer is that in most cases, this interface is human beings. In most cases, you will end up calling a human being to actually go and provision this interface together. So all this automation that we try to do on the left, on the left side, inside the cloud with quantum and OpenStack, breaks apart the moment you need to bring a human being in the, in the picture in order to, bring, to, to touch the two together. Example, let's see how Amazon does it, right? Because this is a classic operational example. So for those that don't know, Amazon has this VPC service, right? And they have the Direct Connect service. So the Direct Connect service says you come and instantiate your VPC inside AWS, and then you bring your VPN into Equinix or some other co-location that we, we deal with, and then you get an Ethernet circuit in the colo facility, and you connect this Ethernet circuit with the Amazon routers, and then your VPC is directly connected to your VPN on this, call, on this specific call facility, right? So in order for, in other words, in order for connecting the Amazon VPC, connecting your enterprise side with the Amazon VPC, you need to go to Equinix or some other call facility like that, and you need to set up a circuit and make the two talk together. So their suggestion and recommendation is, and this is from their website, is they go step one, step two, step three, all these are the things you need to do. And uh, you go to step three and says, you know, work with a partner, blah, 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 go set up the circuit, go do this, go to that. This is essentially a sequence, a story that is gonna take you weeks, right? It's gonna take several weeks before you can actually create a service there, interconnected and so on. And this is part of the problem we need to address, right? And to a certain extent, this is yet another hammer solution. So now, I'm gonna show you how I'm gonna try to build to you the, the solution and how we can try to address all these problems by using what I call known principles. But before I go there, let's take a trip back again to the memory lane and see how people try to address this type of problems before, okay? So there are three proven principles that I'm gonna touch upon here. Um, the first one is the end-to-end -end principle. Pretty much everything in the internet is built around this end-to-end -end principle, and I'll discuss about it, uh, but it's fundamental. It's the end-to-end -end principle. It's the idea that networks are never isolated administrative domains. There are always multiple administrative domains, and when we solve a networking problem, we have to treat it as a multiple administrative domain problem. It's a network of networks. It's never a single network. And the third principle is, let's learn a little bit from the mobile networks and the mobile devices. If you think about it, there are hundreds of millions of mobile devices that come up and down, they get data, they send emails, they remove data, they access the services. How have they done it? What is the tricks there that we can borrow when we create and apply technologies into the cloud environment? So let me start with the internet principles. The internet principle says, and uh, to a very large extent, it's, uh, it, uh, it follows, if you want, the philosophy follows the previous talk here is push the complexity at the edges. Maintain a simple core as much as you can, simple IP core, push the complexity at the edges because when you introduce functionality at the core that you don't need for every service that you offer in the network, you end up with much higher costs. The second principle is the fate sharing principle. What this means is that if you are gonna distribute your state and you, and you lose your state somewhere, you shouldn't affect nodes that are not involved in this state distribution, right? It is okay to lose state and to lose the service if the node that holds the state on the edge gets isolated, but don't centralize your, all your state in one place. And if you lose the central place, the network is gone, right? It's, it essentially argues for an ultimate distribution of the state in the network. And if you look actually, you know, all the stuff that we are mentioning, again, overlays, IP over IP and so on, this is out of a presentation of Steve Deering. Steve Deering is the guy who, some of you know, he did the first multicast protocols, he did IPv6, right? So the whole idea of IP in IP very much follows in these core principles, right? The whole idea of tunneling and so on very much follows in these core principles. The second important aspect is the network is never, as I said, a single administrative domain. And I cannot keep on 
stopping, I, can, I cannot stop to keep on saying that, right? A network is always a network of networks. Even within an organization, you will see the data center network and the, the one network are managed by different entities that they don't often want to talk to each other. A network is always a network of networks. And when we solve the problem, we have to solve it end to end and not confined within the boundaries of a single data center. Let's think a little bit about mobile networks, right? Now, think about, I assume most of you came here to Portland, right? You flew over to Portland from somewhere else. You came here, and what did you do? Did you pick up a landline and call the orchestrator of the mobile service provider to tell the orchestrator, oh, I arrived in Portland, please give me service in Portland? No. What you did is you took your cell phone out, you pushed on the button, and then the service was automatically created. So how was the service created? What happened is the moment you pushed on the button, the cell phone automatically created a registration event with the network. This registration event went to a policy server and found, okay, user Joe showed up in Portland. What is the service that user Joe can get? This is the service that can, user Joe can get. We push the service down to the network. The service is auto-deployed. You don't have a top-down approach and an out-of-band channel that is gonna make all these discussions and conversations in order to provide the service, right? And then when you move your mobile, right, there is the soft handoff idea of mobile networks. When you move the mobile from one base station to the other, you don't go up to the orchestrator to change everything in the network to propagate down information. What you do is you just talk with your two neighbor base stations, and they have enough state to push the state from the one base station to the other in order to do the handoff. So the whole idea is that by distributing the mechanism of handling, right, by distributing the control plane of handling these interactions, on handling the service activation, that's how I can make the system scale. And the mobile guys managed to make it scale, right? They use this policy-driven distributed approach, and they have made this scale to hundreds of millions of subscribers. So let's learn from these approaches when we design the right solution if you want from the problem. So let me put this now together on the solution of the right tool. How do I solve this network virtualization problem for the cloud using the principles that I mentioned earlier in order to provide the complete end-to-end -end solution? So first of all, it is clear that the way to go is simple IP core, intelligent edge. I think there is no reason to disagree anymore about that. We know how to scale IP networks. It's easy to scale IP traffic. We need to push the functionality at the edges. And therefore, an overlay solution that starts with tunnels between hypervisors is obviously the one that is going to scale the easiest, right? So I have hypervisors, I have my applications in the hypervisors or the servers, I create tunnels in order to create these virtual networks to connect everybody together, and I push all things like security, access controls, ACLs, QoS, statistics, whatever you want, I can push them at the edge and keep the core with as little state information as possible. There is no reason at the transport of my network to have any information for each virtual machine that is sitting at the edges. But what about the control plane, right? So the, yes, that is what I want to do. The question is how do I build a control plane to do that, right? And what can I learn from the internet principles we discussed earlier in order to build this control plane? If I go to the, ex the absolute extreme, if I use the internet extreme of building a control plane for that, what I would do is I would push an instance of my control plane on every hypervisor in the network. I would essentially go to the ultimate distributed model. The moment, however, I have tens, tens of thousands, of hundreds of thousands of, of hypervisors, this becomes extremely difficult to scale. If I go in the other approach, in the other extreme, that I think it's also an extreme, is I put a centralized controller, concentrate all the state in my controller, and then I distribute all my flows or my information from my central controller. There is a fundamental problem with this thing, bro, right? It's the whole fate sharing thing. I lose the controller, I lose everybody. I cannot really do that. And yes, you can argue I'm going to do my controller redundant, highly available, all these kind of things. But we have seen either what happened to the AWS instantiations that are extremely distributed and all these things, right? You can always get inherent failures in, the, in distributed systems that once they start propagating, it, it never ends. So as I say, life is a series of compromises. So the middle way is somewhere where we'll find the answer. So yes, the idea of having a controller to manage state in specific hypervisors is very good. 
but we can have multiple of them, and then we need a way to federate these controllers. And now I can go and reinvent the wheel of how to federate controllers, but I can also use technologies that are already available in the internet, right? So by using MPPGP and using the, the technology that has been stabilized over the last 20 years, I can actually federate controllers together and I can exchange state between the controllers without really reinventing the wheel and going after a new standard and so on. But once I have done that and I have used BGP to talk between my controllers, that is also a standard protocol, I have solved a much bigger, a much bigger problem right now, right? I have solved the problem of connecting multiple of these networks together. So if I have multiple data centers, right, I have multiple data centers, each data center is managed by its own controller in order to manage the edges, then I can immediately use the same technique, use essentially BGP service federation to interface between the controllers, and automatically I can use also BGP to interconnect my services with IP and PLS networks that are sitting at the, that are already deployed over there in, in the network. Let's go a little bit though on the, on the uh, whole idea of how do I provision these things, right? How do I interact with this controller now? As I said, remember of the cell phone paradigm. I don't call the orchestrator to say go provision everything, right? I have a distributed policy-based instantiation. So this is how it can work now, repeating essentially the cell phone paradigm. I have a policy system in addition to my controller. So essentially decouple my control layer from my policy and management layer, right? And then I have an application that pops up at the edge. The application creates an event. The event is captured by the controller. The controller goes to the policy system, says, what am I supposed to do with this event? This VM got instantiated by this user. What am I supposed to do with it? The policy server is what identifies the services and the controller pushes, if you go down the hypervisor entries or the exact forwarding entries down to the edge of the system. And if, for example, my VM moves around, then the VM will just give a new event to the controller, and the controller will automatically populate the new, the new entries. There is no need for anything fancy to happen. There is no need for everybody in the system to be involved in order to deal a simple VM move between two hypervisors. Now, how did we bring all this together, right? And this is part of the, if you want the solution or the approach that we, we have brought together. And my colors don't show very well, but I will do my best to explain that. So we always start with a data plane that is an IP data plane. It's a very simple data plane. Use anybody's, uh, if you want hardware, to build a robust IP network. And then we assume that there are one or more of these provider networks that are the networks where enterprises have gotten their VPN services or their managed VPN services or even their internet services and so on. And then what we do is we segregate the network service control plane from the management plane. So on the management plane, we have what we call the, the service directory that we have there that is essentially the policy server. And let's assume that we build a data center zone here, right? We build a data center zone and we introduce a controller in the data center. And the controller can use a standard protocol like OpenFlow, as in this case, to talk to the virtual switches in the hypervisors in order to manage the forwarding entries in the virtual switches in the hypervisors. By, by doing this controller and this very simple instantiation here, we can have then something like OpenStack Quantum that drives the policy for the policy server. And then, for example, the moment the virtual machine pops up somewhere in the data center, this, is, this event is captured by the controller. The controller asks the policy server what happened. And then automatically, I get essentially network connectivity between VMs belonging to the same service, right? So if this VM, if this virtual machine wants to talk to this virtual machine, we use the tunneling mechanism to create a tunnel from one hypervisor to the other, and we forward the traffic from this tunnel. And all these forwarding entries in all these uh, virtual switches are managed by this controller, and they are downloaded on the distributed hypervisors. OK? So far, so good. I have solved the problem pretty much. A lot of plugins in quantum and so on work like that, and that's what this is so far. Here is where the things get a little bit more interesting then. This controller is actually going to talk multi-protocol BGP. It is going to talk multi-protocol BGP with all other existing networks that, that are already out there, right? 
So yes, we move this data center and this cloud to SDN, but we cannot wait for the rest of the world to talk SDN before we can talk to this world. And the, the language that the rest of the world understands is multi-protocol BGP. So this controller now is going to use multi-protocol BGP to talk to the PE of you want, to the provider edge, to the service provider network right, right there, sitting at the edge of the data center. And here's what's going to happen, right? The moment I create a subnet here, and this controller learns about the subnet, it's going to advertise over BGP the existence of the subnet to the provider edge, and the provider edge is going to advertise the existence of the subnet to all the other enterprise sites, and now I will have every enterprise site that belongs in the same tenant, if you want, will have a route that it will know that in order to reach this service that was just created in this particular data center, they have to create a tunnel to this provider edge, and then the provider edge is going to forward the traffic to the corresponding VMs. So I got this automatic stitching, if you want, this automatic connectivity between a network created within a cloud environment and an existing IPVPN by just using the existing control planes and by not requiring any big management, uh, management activity or changing provider OSSs or anything like that. I go a step farther after that, right? I create a second zone in my data center and I create a second zone in my data center and that can be same provider, different providers or so on. It can actually be a different management system. It doesn't need to be VMware uh, uh, OpenStack again. I add the second controller and now the controllers are using again BGP to exchange routes between themselves and to exchange routes with the rest of the network and then suddenly I have a connectivity where if I add a virtual machine down on the second data center, because this controller here is going to learn the routes to these particular VMs from this controller over BGP, then I will know here that if this virtual machine wants to talk to this virtual machine, I can do a tunnel directly from this hypervisor to this hypervisor, and therefore I can start stretching now my virtual networks across data center zones and across different hypervisor technologies, right? So essentially, I created a virtual network here by using this technique that is not only confined within the boundaries of one availability zone in a data center, but it's expanded, it's stretched, if you want, across the availability zones of different data centers. And I can take it even a step farther. I can create another data center. And you can think this as uh, Amazon East and Amazon West and Amazon South and Amazon North or whatever, right? And then suddenly, by using the exact same technique, by adding controllers that federate and talk to each other over BGP, that is a well-known and scalable approach, right? And by exchanging routes, I can expand these virtual networks that I have across data centers and across, uh, across, hypervisors, across hypervisors and across cloud management tools. So I can do this thing where I can have a data center that is running VMware, and I have another data center that is running OpenStack, and I can make all these things talk together on the same virtual network. Why? Because I rely on this whole approach that the control plane uses a standard mechanism to talk to it, to talk among the different instances of the control plane. So essentially, if you think about it, and I'll come back to my original pictures, what we have done here is we take a bunch of hypervisors and an IP traffic, and when we have a model of a virtual network or an abstraction, if you want, of a virtual network, that has several app tiers and it has several zones and so on, and it has enterprise sites and it has public internet, we literally abstract this and we create this entity of the virtual network domain that can span one or multiple data centers, right? This is the, the key trick of this entity. And the second key trick of this entity is that it has the capability to utilize BGP to exchange information with the existing network and by doing that, I can take this entity that I created, this virtual entity in the data centers, and I can interconnect it to all the virtual private networks that are out there and will provide the ultimate connectivity back to my enterprise side. So in the end, I can get a service in a data center of a cloud service provider, a service maybe in the data center of another cloud service provider, my enterprise sites, and everything can come and talk to each other seamlessly without any difficulty in creating management interfaces. And remember what I told you about the configuration steps in Amazon, right? Remember the picture I showed you? Configure VPN tunnels, put your VPN monitor, configure routes, go talk to the other guys, set up Ethernet circuits, do all this kind of stuff. 
What are the configuration steps here? Well, they are very simple. You design the application, you just import a single parameter on BGP, the route target and route distinguisher, and then everything is taken care of. BGP is going to exchange the routes, the distribution of the state is going to happen automatically, and you are pretty much done. There is nothing more to be, much more than that to be done in order to provide this end-to-end -end service over a, a managed network if you want with SLAs. So let me summarize here what I, what I talked about on this time frame. So we started with a network right, that was a closed black box and nobody knew what to do with it. And the first step is, and this is thanks to the whole ideas of SDN and OpenFlow, is we essentially decoupled the control plane from the forwarding plane, right? This is the first step that happened, and this is good. What we are saying here is in order to make this to actually work in a multi-provider, multi-data center, in a real internet environment, this is not enough. This is the first step. The second step that is needed is you need to be able to federate your controllers and make each other's controllers talk to each other, right? And if you want, make the multi-vendor controllers talk to each other because the the thing that has happened is every vendor has their own controller, but you cannot make two controllers talk to each other. And the answer to that is I don't need to reinvent the wheel for that. I can use the existing techniques over BGP that we know in order to federate controllers and expand the capabilities. And the last step is let's separate the policy plane from the control plane. In a lot of the approaches, the control plane and the policy plane, the management plane, are tied together. By doing that, you are forced to try to scale the management plane at the rates that the control plane needs. But if you think about it, the management plane should not be involved in every decision. If a VM moves from one hypervisor to the other hypervisor, you don't need the management plane in the process. It's a control plane function. We need to segregate the control plane from the policy and management plane in order to make this whole network scale. And that is the, the, what I had to talk about. And if you have any questions, I would be glad to answer them. Any questions? OK, thank you very much. Oh, there, there is a question. Hello, I'm Srinivas. So you still have overlay uh, networks, and uh, but that's how you interconnect things. Right? So how do you still achieve tenant isolation when you're spanning across your provider networks? the same way you would achieve it in any VPN network, right? So tenant isolation inside the data center is through the overlay network. Tenant isolation in the service provider network is through MPLS VPNs. Right? No, the virtual switch is a non-VS switch, speaking VXLAN, right? The controller is what is the, the entity that actually speaks control protocols and then programs the virtual suite, right? The virtual suite is obvious. So when, when you recommend using the multi-protocol BGP um, inter-provider, um, how do you address the um, uh, VRF, or, uh, the route target uh, overlap issue? Well, you have to have a single route target space, right? So you will have a route target towards the data center and the route target towards the service provider, and the service provider will manage its route target, and you will manage your route target yeah. on the other side, yeah. right? So would there be like a registry for? Yeah, I mean you have to you have to interface on the API then. Yeah. And you use the AS number also, right? Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>